Okay, let's talk a little bit about um, health physics and radiation protection. Here is the objectives I've got for us. We need to kind of just, again, define ALARA and illustrate its use through time, distance, and shielding. We'll talk about, with a necessary dosage, how to calculate uh, EFD. Um, so we'll actually do an activity related to that. We'll list radiation protection features that we use in radiography as well as in fluoroscopy. Um, and then we'll talk about primary versus secondary radiation exposure, which I've already kind of alluded to in our discussion of the workbook. So let me magnify this just a little bit. Um, ALARA is typically talked about as time, distance, and shielding. And for our purposes, when we're talking about time, we're talking about an exposure is going to be equal to that an exposure rate over a period of time, right? Um, so, for example, some of the exercises that I, it looked like y'all had in your physics homework were kind of similar to this, like um, like ten Rankin per hour for twenty minutes, right? Well, in that case, I've got to figure out um, what that 10 Rankin per hour if delivered over 20 minutes equals. It's going to be less than 10 Rankin, right? Um, it's going to be like some, like a third of that, right? Um, distance, we know to apply the inverse square law when thinking about distance, but when we think about distance too, it's helpful to bear in mind kind of some geometry of the actual room that we're working in, right? Because some of these things, like this has an hourglass shape to it, this exposure rate, because there's a protective curtain there that has maybe one or two half value layers of additional shielding that actually makes it the safest place to stand, even though it's not the furthest distance. Um, it is helpful to understand that the way that scatter works, right, um, typically standing at the head of the fluoro table, you'll be receiving a higher dose than if you were standing directly next to the patient. Um, again, that's it with the use of that protective curtain. Okay? And then, questions about that? Your primary form of occupational exposure is from the patient. Um, and that is because we should not be out in the primary x-ray field, right? We should, all we should be receiving is Compton scatter coming off the patient. And so we can shield with that with a relatively small amount of shielding material like a lead apron, right? Um, here's an example of half value layers that were calculated out. This is nothing to memorize, but just to have an idea of how KVP a good measure of KVP is what half value layer is associated with that energy. Um, so, for example, with a tube potential of 100 KVP, a half value layer in lead is going to be 0.24 lead. For concrete, it's going to be uh, 1.5 centimeters of concrete. Um, and so you can see if we were to bump it now up to 150 kVp and increase the quality of the photons coming out of the tube, we've also increased the density required to attenuate the beam by half. We've increased the half value layer. Okay, now let's talk about effective dose. In our textbook, let me see what page it's on, there's a really unfortunate formula like a terrifying looking formula on page 544. So I want to demystify that formula a little bit for you because it's got like E equals um, the summation of DI times WT, right? That looks really scary to me. Um, but what it's talking about is the way to calculate an effective dose, which sometimes is abbreviated like that. And this will be given to us in sieverts, right? So we will be given some absorbed dose in gray, and then we will need to apply a weighting factor, which we said for x-rays is always one, for the radiation. And then we'll also have to apply a weighting factor for any exposed tissue, right? 
and then we will multiply it by that absorbed dose. And if there's additional exposed tissue, we'll just have to repeat that formula over and over and over again. That's what that E means in our textbook, is the summation of this formula worked out for every possible um, uh, weighting factor, right, that's influential. Um, So, all right, let's, let's talk about chapter 36. So I'm changing gears a little bit, and I want to talk about these radiographic protective features that are there to protect both you and the patient, okay? And one of the first things that we can be thinking about is the source damage receptor distance indicator, right? So when we trip up and miss this in simulation or whatever, or when we forget and we don't have the right SID, we could potentially also be exposing the patient to additional x-rays, right, by not having a proper SID. So it's, we have to check and make sure that the SID indicators are correct. They should be correct. I call these the milk rules, right? SID, collimation, uh, let me see what else. PBL, I call these the milk rule. Why? Because every single one of them should be within 2%, right? Everything, everything in one of them should be within 2% of whatever the value is indicated. So if it says 100 SID and it really is measuring 102 SID, that's still correct, right? It's, well, let's say it's at or under 2%, right? So I may ask you a, t a test question where I say something like, the SID measures 100. When the physics department measures it, it's actually 101 is that within limitations for radiation safety? Yes, it is, because it is um, within 2%. Beam alignment. Um, so every time we have an x-ray exam properly collimated, the beam should be in alignment with the... the the Bucky, right? So we could potentially have a collimation situation where the collimator is saying the beam is this area, but in reality the beam is this area. Well, I'll try to draw that out. So we've got a collimator saying this is the area that you've collimated to, and we've got a beam that's actually like this, right? This is actually okay as long as, again, it's in within 2%, right? Um, but it is something that we test. Filtration is another thing that we will use to make sure that we are reducing the patient's entrance skin exposure because we're reducing the number of weak photons in the x-ray beam, the photons that are made uh, through weaker Bremsstrahlung processes um, or even uh, classical processes. We will test this source for leakage radiation. Right? And I've mentioned that on page 549, we should go ahead and just memorize the leakage amount should be less than one milligray per hour. Right? And I said one milligray per day right, is what we could estimate our lifetime reduction for. Every milligray of exposure, we've reduced our life by one day. There may be a way to kind of remember also the one milligray per hour here. Um, each hour of leakage radiation should not reduce your lifetime by a day, right? It should be less than that, one milligram. And then I mentioned that it's very important for us to have a good understanding of reproducibility, linearity, and operator, and I'm sorry, the other one was uniformity. But um, reproducibility is the variation in x-ray intensity should not exceed 5%, right? 5%. Each time I make an exposure, um, it should give me a, a within 5% of that in the other exposure. That should not exceed 5%? Correct. And it's page 555, or 550 in our textbook. 5% on page 550. And then the acceptable variation in linearity is 10%. And so the linearity is going from 1% MA station to another MA station, but with the same mass, 
they should not vary in intensity by more than 10%. So we'll call that linearity because we're going, let's say it's, we all we want is 50 mass, right? But I could set the MA for 5 MA, or I could set the MA for 500 MA, and the, the, these two exposures should not be different from each other by more than 10%, and that is linearity. Within the x-ray system, we've also got operator shields, right? And so those will reduce our potential exposure um, to something less than natural background radiation from the x-ray tube. Another way to think about shielding, too, is anytime you're doing portable work, you have the option to remove the, you know, the little clicker button, right, the dead man switch, and walk around a corner. So you can shield yourself uh, with shielding, you can shield yourself with distance, you can walk around a corner and use a wall. You have those kinds of operator shields at your disposal as well. Um, another thing to think about is if you, once you get into the surgery, I used to do this quite a bit because I worked a lot in surgery, the, all the C-arms have a foot pedal with like a 15-foot cord on them. So you can take that foot pedal and run it off away from where the patient's at and actually stand behind a lead shield with the anesthesiologist and make all the exposures from behind the lead shield if you play your cards right. So something to think about. You can always be shielding yourself. So for fluoroscopy, we have some similar things. We will need to, re we'll need to be very mindful of the patient's source to skin distance, sometimes called an SSD. And we can go ahead and just memorize these numbers. They're on page uh, 551 in our textbooks. The SSD should not be less than 38 centimeters on stationary fluoroscopes and not less than 30 <coughs> centimeters on mobile fluoroscopes. That comes to 15 inches on stationary and 12 inches on the operating room C arms. So foot. Um, you can remember it with the foot pedal. Uh, there are primary protective barriers in the fluoroscopic suite. Um, they largely are up in the ceiling over the fluoro table, as well as in the walls. So any direction we can point that x-ray tube in the fluoro unit, we've had to calculate a primary protective barrier for where that x-ray is going to hit in the wall or in the floor or wherever, right? Now the tube, for most of these fluoro tables that you're using, is positioned underneath the patient. The tube is underneath the patient. That's why they call it a stationary fluoro tube. The part that the physician is moving around is the image intensifier. The part that comes up over the patient is the image intensifier. It's the part that's receiving the fluoroscopic uh, remnant beam. Right? There is primary shielding built into that Im image intensifier as well. Right? That's why it's kind of hard to move the thing around. It's got several half value layers of lead equivalent mounted in that fluoro unit to catch that remnant beam. Right? So it is doing some shielding work itself. Um, filtration. Fluoro tubes will also be filtered. We do use collimators or we should be using them. There is an exposure control switch so we can we can step behind the barrier to make an exposure if we want to, or we can step away from the table to make an exposure. Um, the Bucky slot cover should click in and cover the opening of the Bucky slot anytime we engage fluoro mode. It just kind of rolls up and covers the Bucky slot. Why? Because that's pretty much right where your gonads are at, right? So if I'm going to operate a fluoro table and I'm going to sit there and the tube is actually down here be beneath the patient, I definitely don't want a Bucky slot cover that's open right there, right at the level of my family jewels, right? <laughs> so it will click into place. It will not work if it does not click into place. It has to click into place. Um, there is a protective curtain. A lot of the physicians like to take the protective curtain off. I would let the physicians do that, but every time they do it, I'm going to put it back on, right? Um, so between patients, if, if there was a physician that elected to remove the protective curtain between patients while I'm cleaning the room, I will replace that protective curtain because all of the calculations they've done for safe operation of that equipment 
include that protective curtain. There's a cumulative timer. It normally, normally dings at like five minutes. It is just a reminder to the physician or whoever's operating that machinery that, hey, that's the five-minute timer. Um, the patient has received this much amount of Rankin of exposure, what have you. And then we can calculate dose area products. A lot of times the machines will do that for us. We're starting to have more and more regulations that require us to report that. Before I left the state of Texas, we had to, they call them DAPs, we had to record a DAP for every floral procedure that we did. Um, so that was a state requirement. I imagine that within the next five, ten years, there will be federal requirements to record that. So here is an example of unshielded versus shielded fluoroscopy. Right? You can see what a difference that shielding makes. So it is worth trying to work around it. And again, we're assuming, on all of our calculations, we're assuming a point source of radiation. That's not really accurate. We're, what we're assuming is an infinitely small point um, in which the radiation comes from. We know that it actually has a real size, but we're going to assume that it's a point. So I mentioned that because that affects geometry, right? But the geometry I want us to think about now is a primary exposure versus a secondary exposure. So for the primary exposure, we're saying that's the patient. It is a direct exposure. It's anything uh, in line of the central ray within the collimated field. It's receiving a direct exposure from the x-ray tube. Um, this could also be the case with radioisotope contamination. So again, if you would like to go use the nuke med path bathroom, guess what? You're getting primary radiation exposure from gamma rays. And they're very high-powered gamma rays. Um, like powerful enough to cause photo disintegration and pair production and stuff like that. Um, primary shielding requires close to six feet of concrete. That's a guesstimate that I've put on there. But they buy some pretty expensive lead material, and they put it, for example, in the honeymoon suite. It's that wall that fronts our hallway here, right? That is a primary barrier. It is designed with a thickness of enough half-lives of lead equivalent to stop the primary beam. You could never wear enough shielding to stop that primary beam. What we are trying to shield ourselves from is scatter radiation. So we're going to call that secondary exposure, scatter from the patient, and some leakage from the x-ray tube, which we said is going to stay below what? The leakage from the x-ray tube will stay below what amount? Thank you. One milligray per hour, right? And the reason why we keep it constrained to that is because that can be shielded with a lead apron. I'm sorry, <laughs> the uh, leakage from the x-ray tube, secondary exposures. So here's some of the thoughts that they have to think about when they're making these uh, barriers, right? What is the distance from the x-ray tube to the barrier? What is the distance in which the general population might walk from that barrier. I worked at one facility. We had a chest x-ray room. All we did was chest x-rays in this room. So the SID was what? 72. It was always 72, in the, 72 inches in this room, 180 centimeters. And for the patient's, I guess, ease or whatever, there was a window, right? The primary barrier in this room was a lead impregnated glass window that looked towards the front, the entrance, the main entrance of the hospital. How the heck did they pull that, right? The other, the secondary barriers on one side of the room were also windows. So you could walk into this x-ray room and almost, and they were, they were reflective glass windows. You could get your chest x-ray while watching and seeing what kind of day was outside. <laughs> right? It was a very state-of-the-art hospital, and those physicists had done a lot of math to figure out how much lead impregnated glass and what distance 
to set the sidewalk from the x-ray room to have enough shielding and distance for it to be basically a primary barrier. Right? So they had essentially calculated a volume of air, right, that was a half-life equivalent, was a lead equivalent in air, right? Which you can do. Air is one way to contain this stuff. Water is another way to contain it. So we can be creative with this stuff. We also have to calculate that occupancy, though. And that means the rooms around it. How often are there people in those rooms? And how often are people in the room itself, which we'll call a use factor or workload? So we'll calculate how often are people in the room being exposed. We will try to monitor controlled areas versus uncontrolled areas, right? Which is one of the reasons why if there's someone that we did not escort into the department, we should probably stop and ask them, who are you, how can I help you, and, and help them understand this is a controlled area because the general public needs to, we have to reduce their exposure to ionizing radiation. If you're in the x-ray department, what I'm saying is, if you're in the x-ray department, you could be exposed to x-rays. Anyone. Anywhere in the x-ray department. If we're firing off x-rays in all these diagnostic rooms, some of them are bouncing around, going through walls, and doing crazy things. So we, it is a controlled area, right? So the patient's mother is, like, sitting there waiting in the hallway for them. Yes. She's still getting... She is getting some of the dose that her daughter is getting, right? Okay. It is significantly less. Like, it's less but than... Is she still, get, still getting some of the dose? Yes. She might even be getting photons that are flying off of her daughter, right? If we could see this stuff, it would kind of open our eyes a little bit. Um, so that's what a use factor, that's what these workloads and use factors are helping us understand is quantifying what the general public is receiving. They are not occupational workers, and we want to keep any exposure that they receive well below natural background radiation. Um, Anytime we increase KVP, we will need to increase the half value layer of the thickness. So when they calculate a primary shield, a primary barrier, they look at what is the highest KVP that you will use on this machine, and that's their value. They don't care about the ones under it because they'll be stopped by the half value layer for the highest possible energy. So they look at what is the manufacturer specs for this x-ray tube, that's what we're going to, the highest KVP value it can do, that's what we're going to make a, a primary shield uh, equivalent for. So again, these primary barriers may be made of lead and concrete. Secondary barriers can be glass, steel, gypsum, wood, water, air even. There can be different ways that we do that. Let's talk a little bit about the detection and measurement. And you'll notice I did not talk at all about the terrorist type stuff because even though our textbook talks about that, it is not necessarily um, important for us. These personnel monitors, films, we used to use x-ray film in the past to do monitoring. We don't do that anymore. The most important one to remember is the uh, OSL here, the optically stimulated uh, dosimetry device. It uses a crystal that's, uh, what is it called, aluminum something, aluminum oxide, that's right. It is very similar to, and that may not be completely right, um, it is very similar to the um, calcium sulfate that's inside of the, the CR image receptors, right? And so a laser scans over it, that aluminum oxide, and it emits light to a, a t an intensity of the absorbed photon that it received, right? Um, we like these OSLs. We use them quite a bit um, because they can report a minimum exposure of like 10 microgray. Um, so they're very, very sensitive. And they can also go upwards of like 40 MeV for photon energy. Right? They can, they, can, they can receive stuff from about 10 microgray up to energy ranges in the level of 40 MeV and whatever um, that would be in gray. Uh, 
For area monitors, very often we use Geiger counters. So if there's an area of contamination or an area where we could suspect that maybe there's some leakage from this room, the shielding wasn't built quite right, we may use a Geiger counter to monitor that. I worked at one radiation therapy department where there was a hot corner, like that corner right there was hot. Anytime we turn on the linear accelerator, that area, the photons were getting through the wall, right? And so a lot of times we would keep a Geiger counter over in that corner to remind us that there is photons constantly getting through that area. Um, that's really the big takeaway there is just the OSLs and the use of Geiger counters for area monitors. As far as like, uh, like occupation exposure of those like mo modalities, which one do you think gets the most exposure from like the work that I think it's interventional folks that get the highest occupational exposure. Nuke med techs get a significantly high dose too. X-ray techs would be next. Probably the bottom of the barrel, barrel is most radiation therapists, unless they're working in brachytherapy. <coughs> and they could get quite a bit too. All right, and here is the patron saint of uh, radiation protection, right? I had a student drew me this not too long ago. So she has a, a balance beam in one arm constantly weighing the risks and the benefits of everything that she's doing, right? She's like Lady Justice, though, but like Lady Justice, she is not blindfolded, right? She is looking at things clear-eyed, and she's not thinking about... Um, she is concerned with whether this is a female or a male patient. Like Lady Justice, she's supposed to weigh everything equally. Lady Dosimetry does not do that. She's looking, is this a female patient? Is it a young female patient? Okay, the risks now are significant compared to the benefits. And then, of course, her baseball bat is the dose that she's going to hit you with. It won't kill you, but it could potentially knock you out. Um, 